to begin with a story after the Buddha's enlightenment, after his night under the Bodhi tree, he spent some time walking around and uh, people would meet with him and see that he looked very, he had a glow. He looked very bright and very peaceful and a lot of interest in, you know, well, who is this guy? And they'd ask him, they'd say, who are you? And his response, they'd say, are you a healer? No. You know, are you a saint? No. You know, are you in some, some way a master, a contemplative? No. You know, he'd, he'd answer no to, are you a holy man? No. And finally, he, his response was this, I am awake. Just that, I am awake. And what I love about this story is if we ask ourselves about the moments in our life when we feel um, perhaps most happy or peaceful or inwardly free, and then we say, well, in those moments, you know, when we're really feeling that kind of ease, um, what's our sense of who we are? And we're not going to go and say, well, I'm a professional da-da-da-da, and we're not going to go and say, well, you know, I'm a social activist, or I'm a Buddhist, or I'm a Latino. Or I'm, we don't, that's not where our minds go, because we're living in a, a sense of being that's broader than any identity we can name. Like the Buddha, there's a wakeful openness, a, a heart field, a space a tenderness, but it's narrowing to come up with an identity. So, in contrast, when we're very upset, when we're angry, when we're reactive, when we're playing out an addiction, if that question comes up, who am I? The sense of self is very small, very solid, and in those moments pretty identified as a wanting self or a fearful self or an addicted self or whatever. But we're very solid. And the other characteristic is there's a sense of separateness. You know, when we're in a strong, reactive, unpleasant emotional state, always with that, we might not be noticing it, but we feel very alone. We feel very much like we're here and the world's way out there. Separateness. From the Judeo-Christian you know, the, the myth of our, our part of this world, um, we're kicked out of the garden in those moments, right? Okay, those are the moments when we're caught in reactivity that we no longer belong. We are outside of the garden. And in the Buddhist psychology, we are very much in a trance of separation at those times. And that's the description of suffering. Now, suffering doesn't have to be anguish kind of suffering. I mean, for many of us, we go through the day in that trance of separateness, but the symptoms are more like worrying, anxious, restless, you know, on our way to something else. They're kind of our daily routine. It's kind of a mentality that's small, but we're not calling it suffering. If we pause, though, when we're feeling separate, if we pause, we'll feel inside us um, a real discomfort. It's usually in this area. And if we really let ourselves be there, we don't usually stay. We usually keep covering it over with activity. But if we pause when we're in that trance of separateness, we'll find that there's a kind of anxiety, um, a deep sense of fear that something around the corner is going to go wrong. There's a sense that something doesn't feel right. And if we scratch even more, we'll find that it's, I don't feel right. It's not only I feel bad, it's I am bad in some way. Very, very common. So we start examining this trance of separation, and with it, when we're feeling separate, along with that is some sense of, uh, I could fail, I could be rejected, you know, in some way I'm going to blow it, in some way I'm not going to be enough, I'll be hurt, and then, of course, I'll die. That's what's around the corner. I mean, you know, we're living this a kind of hairy, out-of-control life, and the destination's not real popular, right? 
I mean, that's, that's somebody told me that the story of a, at a funeral service, uh, a woman, a very, very elderly woman, the undertaker approached her and asked how old her husband was. And she said, 98, you know, two years older than me. He said, oh, he comments, oh, so you're 96. And uh, she responded, hardly worth going home, isn't it? <laughs> But we live with that sense of, you know, we're on our way and around the corner, there really is going to be something bad or too much, too much for us, too hard to handle. So we're, as Chogyam Trungpa, the Tibetan teacher, put it, we're like this bundle of tense muscles kind of protecting our existence because if we feel separate, it's threatened. Okay, so that's kind of a state of affairs. Now, the effect of living in an egoic identity as a culture with this underlying hum of fear of something's wrong is that as a culture we overconsume. we're always trying to feed ourselves in some way we over, we're, we're over aggressive, we're always trying to protect ourselves in some way we lose a sense of the sacred because we're always in this societal level of a reactivity in other words, we really we lose the sense of the sacred because there's not a touching in so much to the beauty and the goodness that's here because we're scared. I, I ran into this story that in the early 1850s, uh, J- James Whistler spent a brief and very unsuccessful uh, period at West Point, U.S. Military Academy. And as the story goes, he was assigned to draw a bridge, and he drew a romantic stone bridge, (laughs) complete with grassy banks and two small children fishing from it. Well, the instructor was very annoyed. He said, get those children off that bridge, you know. So this is an engineering exercise, okay? So Whistler uh, got the kids off the bridge, and he drew them fishing from the bank of the river. Resubmitted the drawing, the angry instructor yells at him, I told you to remove those children, get them completely out of the picture. So the next, this creative urge, of course, was too strong in Whistler. Uh, The next version, he had the children completely out of the picture. There were two small tombstones. (laughs) But it says something about, you know, our task orientation as a a culture. I often use that term, you have to, to be kind, you have to swerve from your path. Well, we're so focused on get this done, accomplish that, protect ourselves from this. We're so worried and busy. Um, we, We don't pause that much not only to see who's here around us, but also just to be intimate with our hearts. So losing a sense of the sacred. And then, of course, in our individual lives, um, we have this bias, and it's evolutionary, towards what's painful, towards, towards fear. So we scan, and our mind and our attention, our thoughts go to what we're worried about, what can go wrong, what's missing. So we might have made been in a situation where we did well in some ways but made one mistake, where does our attention go to? You know? I used to teach, uh, when I was teaching at Kripala, they don't do this anymore, they used to send me like 140 sheets of, from feedback that everybody wrote and I would go through the papers looking for the ones where the mark was not that good on some of the, and those are the ones I'd read and I'd start, you know, chulling, you know just churning over that's the way the mind works. We fixate on what's wrong. Some of you might remember the story of this school in the Midwest somewhere where the children uh, released three goats into the school and they painted numbers on them. One, two, and four. <laughs> so the administrators were spent the whole day looking for goat number three, right? <laughs> But you get the idea that we're the way our minds work. So, this is the ego self, the separate self that's trying to navigate to protect itself and enhance itself. And it really does go back, I think, to the myth of the culture that, you know, we're kicked out of the garden and something's wrong with life 
and there's a sense of something's wrong with us and we need to cover over, you know, the ego is a kind of a covering to present ourselves to the world because there's something off. I read that, you know, Adam said, said to Eve something like, I wear the plants in this family, you know. <laughs> it's like we're covering it over. So. so the question is, and this is in spiritual life, the real inquiry, is, is this familiar ego self that feels separate and that's trying to, you know, solve problems and trying to get things done and uh, make life a certain way, stay, be in control, is this really who we are? Okay, that's really the question. Are we really wandering lost outside of the garden? Is that our predicament? So this is a Tibetan teacher and writer, Sogyal Rinpoche. And you might just close your eyes for a moment, just listen to these words and just sense Sense your life, sense how the seasons have moved through, the changes in your body, in your activities, how there's been this maybe ego self, this sense of separateness, but navigating, but everything keeps moving, keeps changing, is pretty out of control. And then what Sogil Rinpoche asks, he says, if everything changes, then what is really true? Is there something behind the appearances, something boundless and infinitely spacious in which the dance of change and impermanence takes place? Is there something, in fact, we can depend on that does survive what we call death? Now, it's just an inquiry. This is a teaching that you can sense well. What does that mean? I mean, if everything we can sense about ourselves, this separate self, is that this body-mind is changing, everything around us is changing, is there anything that's timeless? Is it all happening in something larger? Is there a stillness, a silence, an awareness? that is really our true home. This is the inquiry. And I can say that, uh, you know, in the moments that we touch real happiness, that we're intuiting some presence that doesn't have to do with life working out a certain way. And when we sense beauty or when we touch peace, we're sensing some presence that is awareness. It's not the thing that we're focusing on, that there's something in the background. I sometimes describe it as some alert inner stillness. It's who's listening right now, who's really listening. Not the processes that are filtering, but just the pure knowing. The word Buddha, awake, sometimes it's described as you are the knowing. That's your pure awareness. So when we are resting in that pure wakefulness, that openness, when we're not caught in a smaller identity, there's an enlarged sense of what we are. In those moments, we are the garden. It's not like we're in the garden. We are the garden. And we realize we never left. It was just a confusion, a delusion. But I'm getting ahead of myself because that's the general place I want to pay attention to, which is when we're lost, how do we find ourselves back sensing uh, this home, this garden that we are? And back to the Buddha, one of the stories I most love in uh, the Buddha's awakening, where, so we're not after he's been enlightened, when he's walking around, this is the process of waking up, was that he got challenged by all the conditioning that makes our minds and hearts and bodies contract. 
And that was kind of his waking up process was all these challenging energies that were really, they, it was described as Mara as, you know, the greed and hatred and delusion that came at him as arrows and slings and bows and so on. But really, it was the energies of his own, you know, universal challenging energies we all experience. And he didn't wake up because they weren't there. He woke up because of the ways that he responded to them. That's good news for us. That says that each of us on our paths, our freedom doesn't come because we've gotten rid of our selfishness, gotten rid of our doubt, gotten rid of our fear. It comes because we've discovered a way to respond, to relate. That's where the freedom is. Then the weather systems can keep happening. But we're the whole garden, you know? We can, we can include them. So here's the Buddha under the Bodhi tree getting challenged. And he, he got his final big challenge. And some of you might know that in this myth, the final big challenge was doubt. And I think it's the challenge for most of us when we really doubt our fundamental okayness. We really doubt that uh, we have that goodness, that Buddha nature, that sacredness. Instead, we sense a flawedness. So he got challenged by doubt. And his response to the challenge, and this is, to me this is the kind of the beauty of the myth, it wasn't like he tried to bring this muscle of attention and kind of work with that in, in some um, confrontational way. He reached out and he touched the ground. And he called on the earth goddess to bear witness. It was to kind of bear witness to, in a sense, mirror and witness his goodness, his essential nature. Okay. And in the moment that he touched the ground and called on the earth goddess, you know, the heavens grew dark and there were the lightning bolts and everything, and Mara kind of pulled away. And it was then that the Buddha was completely free. Now, what had he done? What does it mean? <clears throat> When we're caught, <clears throat> when we're lost, <clears throat> what, <clears throat> what does it mean when we're in that trance of separate, reactive, small sense of who we are? What does it mean to touch the ground? Because this is really, this is the possibility. And in my understanding, the Buddha was touching the ground, he was connecting, he was bringing his awareness to really the web of life. He was saying, you know, I belong to this web of life. So that was the first piece. It's like when we, when all this stuff is going on and we say, okay, just come back to what's actually happening right here this breath, this heartbeat, this squeeze in the chest, this clay body of the earth, we're coming back to the earth. We're not spinning in ideas. So he connected to the truth of the present moment and he called on loving presence, he called on his belonging to all beings, to the universe, to awareness. So he was reconnecting. It's like from separate to reconnecting. That's the beauty of this um, gesture. So we sense for ourselves, you know, what does that mean? Uh, because I know when I see people working with emotional wounds or just working with their particular egoic trance patterns and beginning to find a space of being more relaxed, more at home with themselves, um, not caught in that second arrow so much, just really kind of honoring and, and being at peace some. When I see that shift, that person has in some way learned how when things get um, more trancy, how to touch the ground, how to come back into the aliveness that's right here, and also how to come back into relatedness. Because remember, when we're in trance, we feel disconnected. So a key part of coming back and touching the ground is remembering we belong to each other. 
it's more true that we belong to this field of presence and love that's here than it is any identity we walk around and tell ourselves about. When we remember our relatedness, a lot happens. First of all, our fear goes down. In the moments of feeling connected with others, the limbic system quiets down. And there's all sorts of great research that when we know the truth of our belonging, when someone just holds the hand of a person they trust and their brain waves are measured for fear, their brain waves calm down. When we hug for 20 seconds, oxytocin, that feeling of well-being, you know, the biochemistry of well-being gets activated, starts washing through our system. Connection works. It also brings out the um, inner resources that get covered over when we're in fear. We become more creative and spontaneous. When we touch the ground and remember our connection, we become more creative, more empowered. One of my uh, favorite stories is of uh, a guy who uh, his car stalls out into a ditch and there, he walks to a nearby farmhouse because he needs some help getting it out and the farmer says, old Warwick, he's got this kind of donkey, he can help you pull it out. So he, you know, hitches the Warwick some ropes to the car and then he starts calling out, go Henry, go Jacob, go, Dana, go Warwick and Warwick goes, and pulls the car out of the ditch and the guy says, Why'd you say all those names? He goes, oh, old Warwick, he's blind. When he thinks he's part of a team, he can do anything, you know? <laughs> I think I just like the name Warwick for, for a donkey, you know? <laughs> so, touching the ground, knowing our belonging. The challenge is, as I've mentioned, that when we're most stuck is when we feel most alienated. So again, I'm going to, where I want to move now is how when we're most feeling apart, when we most feel alone, when we most feel we're in that really limited narrative about who we are, how we begin to sense a larger belonging. Because I think that's the question. I mean, you might ask yourself, if you think this week at any time that you felt caught, any time you felt like you got into a real rut and you um, got grim or depressed or anxious or angry, you might have an occasion in mind. Maybe a conflict with an important person or a sense of feeling like a failure, in some way paralyzed, overwhelmed by things to do. If you think and reflect to those moments and you ask yourself, well, what was my sense of relatedness then? I mean, did you feel close to anybody? Could you feel empathy towards others? Could you receive care or give care? I mean, for most of us, when we're in that fight-flight reactivity, the parts of the brain, the parts of the frontal cortex that are involved with relationship, with our social being, with empathy and compassion are shut down. I'm, being, I'm using extreme terms, but you get the idea. When we're stressed and reactive, our, we are cut off from a sense of relationship. And we're also cut off from a sense of our own beingness because we turn on ourselves too. So the primary characteristic of our reactive suffering is separate, cut off. So the inquiry then is how do we, how do we sense a larger belonging? And I think part of the, the reason I wrote uh, True Refuge, uh, and I'm going to be drawing more and more of my talks over these next months from the chapters of True Refuge because they're so fresh with me right now, is the sense that every one of us is trying to discover our pathway to true belonging, to belonging to presence, to belonging to love. That we each are find, either are trying to find or finding uh, our way to refuge, to feeling at home, to feeling that we are the garden again. 
and there are different pathways. Now, the primary pathway back to the garden that we speak of in these classes, in these Vipassana mindfulness classes, are to cultivate the skill of coming back right to this moment. If you can do it, if something, if you're very, very stirred up and you can say, okay, what is actually happening right now? And it's almost like you're nailing your attention to this moment. It's really, really close in. And stay and stay and stay. You discover some freedom. How come? One of my favorite ways of considering it um, is if you think of the length of an emotion. I mean, Jill Bolte brought this to uh, the woman who had, the, the neuroscientist who had the stroke, and she described that the length of an emotion, if it's just pure, this affective emotion, 90 seconds, a minute and a half. Now, how come they last longer for us? How come? How come most of us, they last 10 years? <laughs> you know? We feed them with? Story. With story, exactly. The only way your emotions can keep going and stay fairly static is if you keep fueling them with thoughts. If you truly step out of the storyline and keep anchoring your attention to this squeeze, to this tightness, to this feeling of pounding, to this emptiness, okay, to the soreness or sadness or whatever it is, if you keep staying with your senses, so that the stories aren't feeding the emotion, they change. They might change into, you know, pity might change into despair, might change into fear, might change into terror. I'm not saying they change to something pleasant, you know. <laughs> but they change, and that is heartening because we start sensing, now back to that quote, is there something beyond this changing nature? we start sensing as we stay and stay the presence that's here, that alert stillness as all the weather systems are moving through. There's a shift in identity. Now this is the power of mindfulness. A mindful awareness notices what's happening in the moment and instead of continuing to fuel that um, cycle of feeling thought, feeling thought, feeling thought, we relax into the presence that's observing and touching and feeling. And the who we are gets larger. We start belonging to the aliveness and the presence versus the person, the narrative that's a victim of a feeling. Does that make sense? The shift in identity? Okay, so this is touching the ground touching the ground of what's actually going on right here. Very powerful gateway back into the garden. Now the challenge, and I'm going to spend the rest of the evening on this, is that when we're experiencing afflictive emotions and we're all stirred up, it's very hard to keep the attentiveness with what's right here in the moment because it feels intolerable. And so, you know, if we have a whole lot of training and a whole lot of balance and equanimity, we can do it, but sometimes it's just too much, especially when it's fear or shame. Really, really difficult to stay with. So, what then? How do we touch the ground? And again, I think that this uh, story of the Buddha, that the Buddha called out, remember, he called out to the earth goddess, he called out to some trustworthy presence. And uh, this, if one of the stories that I find really instructive is of Baba Ramdas, who had a stroke, massive stroke. And he had practiced in many, many different disciplines. Uh, he had Buddhist, Hindu, Advaita, etc. He said that none of his tools from his spiritual toolbox, none of them worked when he was in that moment of stroke. He said he lay in an utterly helpless state. He was uh, staring up at the pipes on his ceiling and there was no uplifting thoughts, no inspiration, nothing to relieve the suffering. Um, he was unable to regard things with mindfulness, unable to have any compassion. Now this is 
a figurehead for my generation anyway of um, the one who recognized be here now, you know, and, and had all these different ways of moving through challenging things. He said, at that cru- crucial moment, and this is how he put it, he said, I flunked the test. Now there's a power to this story because how many of us have had those doubts that, wow, when things get uh, down and darkest, I'm not able to call on any of this uh, mindfulness stuff. How many of us have condemned ourselves for that? Well, here's, it's, it's valuable to know that it might be that we get knocked around and in the moment we can't figure out how to touch the ground. But there is a way. And, and here's what happened for Ram Dass. In the thick of the crisis, he began to pray to Maharaji. Now, Maharaji was the guru he knew from... He, Maharaji was no longer alive, but Maharaji for him was a pure emanation of love. So it was a very living love, and that's what he prayed to. He prayed to that living love. He said, I talked to my guru's picture, and he spoke to me. He was all around me. He was immediately there, as fully available as ever. And to Ram Dass, that was grace. It was with that realization of his guru's presence that everything became okay. I call this taking refuge in love. So we take refu- we touch the ground and take refuge in truth by being with this present moment. We touch the ground and take refuge in love by calling on something that's a source of loving. That's there, but we're not as connected to it as we want to be. Because we need to feel that belonging. Because the belonging is true, we need to find our way back to it.